Welcome to our, our second community forum in the town of Wilmington and the Wilmington Public Schools Wildwood Early Childhood Center School Building Project. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Glenn Brand, and I have the privilege and pleasure of serving as the superintendent of the Wilmington Public Schools, as well as the chair of the Wildwood School Building Committee. More about the building committee in just a moment. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening as we continue our efforts to inform the residents of our wonderful community here in Wilmington about this extremely important project for our future of our students, staff, and families at the elementary level. Wilmington has again been provided with the opportunity for financial assistance from the only grant funding program in the state for new school construction or renovation, and that is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or as undoubtedly referred to many times this evening, the MSBA. In 2015, the new Wilmington High School was built with the support of the MSBA funding and we are fortunate enough again as a community to have been invited into the program. Next slide, Jason. Uh, we have an extensive presentation this evening and we wanna try and cover an awful lot of information. Why? Well, it's simple because after all, this is a community project in which we only not only want, but need the full support of our community to help us realize the potential before us with this project as we seek to begin the journey of making much needed improvements to our elementary school facilities. This is an overview of our agenda this evening and during the course of the next hour or so plus, these broad topics will be covered. First, what will the Wildwood MSBA project, what it is and most importantly, what it can be. Well, by title, this is a project centered on replacing the Wildwood school. It absolutely holds the potential to be far more than a project that just impacts that school community alone. As I said, we want throughout this project's pro uh, progress your feedback as well as your engagement. Whether you're a staff member here in the district or parents or guardian, there will be plenty of opportunities both tonight as well as in the future for you to participate from your couch or wherever you might be watching this presentation this evening. We intend to fill you in more on the MSBA process and the various schedules that we are complying with and that we have to align with in order to keep us moving forward. We will take you through a closer examination of the current state of our schools that are included in this project. That of course being the Wildwood, the Woolbert and the North. And we call this the existing condition study of which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, in a little bit. We will dig deeper and provide you with the project needs as we see them at this point in time, along with preliminary design options. A key piece of this phase of the work is to develop an evaluation matrix for the members of the school building committee to evaluate options in the near future and ultimately select one project to move forward. And we'll provide you with a highlight of where that uh, is currently at. And we will conclude tonight with highlighting the various ways that as a resident, staff member, or just a member of the community, you can remain connected with a part of the development of this project. Uh, next slide. So this is an exciting time for this project. Uh, we're still certainly in its early uh, conceptions. Uh, and um, this indeed is a project uh, that requires many, sorry, um, uh, Jason Beck. I wanna take this opportunity to introduce uh, some of the key members of this project though at this point in time. Uh, next slide, the, uh, under the requirements and regulations of the MSBA, the district is required to form a school building committee which was really one of the fundamental first steps in this project. The building committee's first responsibility was to hire the owner's project manager or OPM. And that firm ultimately hired was SMMA to represent the town and the citizens' interests in this Wildwood project. Our Wildwood School Building Project OPM is the firm SMMA as mentioned, and Julie LaDuke is here this evening uh, and will be speaking uh, with you a little bit later in this presentation as a panelist. Immediately after the selection of the OPM, the building committee then set out to hire a designer, which is essentially the architect of the project. Our design firm, Doran Whittier, uh, who is here this evening, is making, re making a return to the town of Wilmington after their recent work on designing the Wilmington High School. Ronnie Phillip and Jason Boone from Doran Whittier, along with uh, Lee Dorr, are here this evening and will be helping out as panelists. Next slide. As I mentioned, the Wildwood School Building Committee, or the Building Committee, is a central component of this project and ultimately serves as the decision-making body of this school building project. And it is important to point this out. Unlike other town-related projects, where perhaps one of the other locally elected governing bodies make decisions on certain topics or issues, 
The building committee is the decision-making entity that will ultimately make the recommendations to the MSBA and the town regarding the exact project to move forward in this process. Exactly because of this, we worked hard with our OPM who recommended to our town and school district officials that we should try and intentionally develop a building committee that is large enough to include stakeholder representation. But we wanted to make sure that each key group was represented. That is why you will see representation on the committee from our staff, school and town administrators, parents guardians, as well as elected leaders. And this is an overview of all of the various members who comprise the school building committee and who have been meeting regularly and will continue to do so as we move forward in the project. Next slide. So this is an indeed an exciting time for this project, uh, which is still largely, as mentioned, at its early conceptions. This is a project, though, that starts with a vision, a vision of what members of our community want and hope to see in a new elementary school facility. This is not a school that is built out of a box or from a blueprint that circulates from community to community. From, for some here in Wilmington, though, developing a vision of what a new elementary school can look like in this decade of the 2020s might be a little challenging. Why? Well, it's been some time since as a community, we built a new elementary school. In fact, it's been over 60 years. And a lot has changed in school design and construction since then. So in order to make sure that members of our team, our committee and our community can get a sense of what a new school can be, we recently went, went and took a tour of new schools in the area. And like it's always said, a picture is worth a thousand words. I'll let the video put together by Ms. Bissell, our principal of the Wildwood recently, speak for itself to try to capture the experiences that those who went on the tours uh, realized firsthand. We don't have your audio, Jason. School in Acton, Boxborough, the Maria Hastings School in Lexington. located on the Hanscom Air Force Base. The following video shares the perspective gained during those school tours from various members of the team. The security and camera features allowed for a safe place to work and learn. The schools had designated public and private zones so that the general public could not access classrooms, teachers, or students without clearance to do so. Several things struck me about the schools we visited, along with other new schools I visited or worked in compared to our existing schools. Their use of natural lighting, interior lighting that automatically dims when they sense sufficient outdoor lighting, the use of tile on the walls to prevent drywall and paint damage, more welcoming and age-appropriate color schemes, no wax flooring, the effective use of glass to create visual, visual observation opportunities without distracting the students, and creative murals that add to the overall feel of the space. As a special education teacher, I really appreciated the schools that added sensory or motor rooms into their design plan. Having easy access to such specially designed rooms plays such an important role in all aspects of development for preschool and kindergarten learners, in particular those with autism and or high sensory needs. The flex spaces that we saw during our school tours were really quite impressive. These flex spaces allow for students or a small group of students to work in a small breakout group or to receive special support. This really supports the diverse learning needs of our students. Our students deserve the opportunity to have a learning space that meets their needs and these flex spaces really allow for that. These types of flex spaces don't currently exist in the space we have and this would allow our teachers and support staff to better meet the needs of our students. While walking through the classrooms, it was wonderful to see flexible seating options as well as versatile furniture options that could allow for different types of student work, whole group, small groups, individual, and strategic groupings. 
With a new school building comes new opportunities. Opportunities to have our students in state-of-the-art facilities that are built and designed for students of their specific age and needs. Our students will have access to fully accessible, age-appropriate outdoor play and learning spaces that meets the accessibility needs of all students in our community. As a conscientious educator, I was happy to see all of the innovative and environmentally friendly aspects incorporated into each school I visited. As an example, one school collected rainwater from the roof and then used that water to flush all the toilets in the building. All three schools I visited were working towards or had already achieved net zero emissions. The new buildings we visited offer increased capacity to support community programming. The schools feature a variety of modern spaces, including art studios, STEM labs, music suites, gymnasiums, libraries, cafetoriums, and multi-purpose or flex learning areas. All of these could be used by the Wilmington Rec Department programs, youth sports, scout meetings, PAC events, community music ensembles, and other events. Of note, many of the buildings are designed so that the core academic learning areas can be locked after school hours while still allowing public access to the community use spaces. As a parent, one of my favorite parts of the school tours was over hearing the teachers um, discussion. They were amazed at the possibility. And it was amazing to me how quickly they went from seeing something that they hadn't, couldn't even imagine to exactly how they would use it and exactly how um, it would enhance their ability to teach their students. The potential of this building project is really exciting. I cannot wait to see how this plan comes together and I'm most excited for the current and future students here in Wilmington to have a learning space that they truly deserve. For many years now, the Town of Wilmington and our Public Buildings Department has done an admirable job maintaining our elementary school facilities. However, maintenance falls far short of improvements necessary to support teaching and learning in this current time period. Many things have changed in education with the need to support the changing needs of our students and in curriculum and instruction. The interior spaces of our six elementary schools throughout town have not changed and remain the same as they were built well over 50 and 60 years ago. Unfortunately, these facilities simply cannot provide the physical environments to best support the important work of our educators, nor are the types of spaces that best allow our young people to thrive in their learning. The Wildwood MSBA building project is far more than just a desire to have a school that is shiny and new. It is about taking steps to ensure the appropriate size classrooms and other educational spaces are in place to support our children and their needs. The town of Wilmington recognized a little over 15 years ago that the former Wilmington High School needed to be replaced because it was old, dated, and did not provide the type of modern facilities to best support teaching and learning. Our elementary students and staff deserve nothing less, and the importance of providing modern facilities for our earliest of children is no less critical. Now is the time for our entire Wilmington community to help us chart the next chapter for not only the Wildwood Project, but our entire school district. Thank you for your time and your support. Thanks, Jason, for showing that. We, uh, we have, a, again, a lot of information to get to tonight, but this is also going to be an interactive uh, presentation, as you'll see as we go through the next uh, number of slides. We are seeking your feedback, and you'll have a chance for those in attendance tonight, um, as well as those who are going to have the chance, hopefully, to watch this on re uh, recorded later uh, in the week to provide your feedback. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason, who's going to take you through uh, some of the tools that will be used tonight and exactly how that will work. Jason? Thank you, Dr. Brand. Um, we're actually using two digital platforms tonight. Obviously, we're using Zoom to host the meeting itself. We are, we are also going to use Zoom as a way um, to allow folks to ask questions all along the way. We will get to those questions uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. But we also have in the Mentimeter platform um, several prompts uh, where we would like specific feedback on specific issues, as well as your insight on some of the options that are going to be prepared tonight. All of your feedback in the Mentimeter platform, it's important to note that that will be anonymous, um, but that your reactions uh, will be 
uh, recorded and tallied. We're not expecting any sort of formal votes tonight, but the information that you're gonna provide will be essential to the school building committee um, and the decisions that are in front of them for this upcoming submission. Some of you may have used this tool before, but uh, we find that it works best on a cell phone or a tablet device. So if you have those devices with you, um, if you point the camera at the QR code, um, it should take you to this and it should show up on your device. If, uh, if you don't have a camera on your device, you can actually go to menti.com and enter the code that's present on this screen and it will also take you to the presentation. We'll just ask folks, and I see that some of it is happening right now, give us a thumbs up um, when you've been able to connect to the platform. We'll give folks a couple of minutes, uh, just a minute or so to, uh, to get there. We're also gonna paste in the chat um, these two techniques for getting to the platform so that if during the presentation um, you either lose your connection or new folks join, um, they have the ability to do so by looking at the chat. It looks like about half of the participants have managed to join. We'll give this just a, a, another 30 seconds or so. Okay, it looks like the, the likes, the thumbs up have, uh, have slowed down, so we'll, we'll move on. The first prompt we'd like you to respond to is a demographic one. Again, right, there's no way for us to identify who you are, but if you can respond to sort of what category or categories you might fall into, it will help us better understand um, which groups uh, are responding in what kind of ways. Wonderful, looks like we have quite a lot of parents being represented tonight, um, several teachers, several community members. And so in addition to these kinds of prompts, <clears throat> we're gonna leave the reactions. You'll just make them out in the lower right-hand corner um, of your screen. Those uh, opportunities to react will be present on uh, nearly every slide. Um, if you're really attracted to something and you think it's a good idea, give us a thumbs up. If, if you're not attracted to that idea, give us a thumbs down. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're um, gonna deploy two techniques for asking questions. During the meeting itself tonight, we are gonna use the Zoom platform. There's a Q&A feature um, should be in the menu bar at the top of your Zoom screen, where we're going to invite you to write questions in that uh, in that particular tool, and then Dr. Brand will uh, work our way through those questions um, at the conclusion of this meeting. In addition, tonight's opportunity to interact, um, we are going to leave this Mentimeter presentation open for a week um, after the show, and. Starting tomorrow morning, we will turn on the question and answer feature inside of Mentimeter itself. It will show up um, as an oval gray button, as you see here on the screen, so that you can still ask questions um, related to the presentation materials, even after tonight's meeting has concluded. Jason, just before you go on, uh, there was uh, one question that came in just relevant to people watching these numbers as you uh, take us through the, um, uh, the feedback. Uh, we are delivering this uh, presentation tonight through webinar uh, uh, webinar format. Um, some have asked how many people are actually tuned in. What I see right now is a total of 73 participants. Uh, keep in mind that we have a, a handful of panelists here, 74 in fact right now. But what we also don't know is how many people are watching through WCTV's platform and their partnership in making this available to the community. So um, out of interest, we have about right now 74 participants in total. Uh, give or take a couple of panelists. So thanks, Jason. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Brand. So the school building committee is particularly interested in those in attendance tonight, their feedback on sort of these couple of issues. Um, 
we're going to ask uh, about your goals and aspirations. Um, currently under consideration, there's sort of three different flavors of grade configurations and consolidation. We're going to ask some uh, pointed prompts about that. One of those three grade configurations um, has a gymnasium size that's different from the other two. So we're going to ask you about the, uh, the gym as a community resource. And then we're going to share all of the conceptual options that have been explored to date. And through the reaction mechanism, we're going we're gonna to invite you to identify your preferences for those. And then finally, near the end of the show, um, Dr. Brand mentioned that an evaluation matrix uh, will be developed to evaluate the options against the guiding principles for design and ultimately the community's uh, values and desires. So we're going to invite some feedback uh, related to identifying what those criteria could be. So the Glenn, you want to talk about this prompt? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. So with that, again, for those uh, that are uh, uh, have jumped onto the Mentimeter platform, we're curious uh, as you start this journey with us and uh, in the early stages of this project, what one word or short phrase might be that best describes your vision, your hopes, your goals for this school building project? As the responses are coming in real time, uh, I'll just share with folks that what's happening is the platform is analyzing the words that are coming in and the larger the word, the more frequent um, it's appearing in participant responses. Just let this run for another couple of seconds. Looks like we've got 46 total responses so far. Consolidation is appearing the most frequent by lots of other good things here, being inclusive, being modern, functional, uh, a better learning experience, presumably for both the students and the faculty. Julie? Julia, I think that's, um, am I taking that or are you taking that? No, I think that's you, Glenn. What I thought, okay. Um, just back a slide if you would, Jason, for a moment. One of the realities um, that uh, our community needs to keep in mind is that we are participating in this formal grant program, the MSBA program. It's an agency that, as mentioned earlier, grants money to eligible communities for whom they invite in based upon school building needs, as well as a clear ability and commitment to partner with the MSBA. They ultimately want to see these projects succeed, and they uh, they really are uh, only looking to communities that can make that happen. What this means is there's a very defined schedule laid out for communities such as ours that has to be followed. We are exactly where we need to be in the timeline, as you will soon see, uh, but we are obligated to keep pushing forward and stay in the program, and I just think that that's, that's an important piece to point out. You'll hear a little bit more about the schedule in just a moment. Uh, next slide, uh, Jason. But sort of going back a little bit, uh, just for those that might be tuning in for the first time to this conversation and this, this, this important project, how did we get here? When I began as a superintendent in Wilmington in the summer of 2018, uh, my journey of learning began here in Wilmington on a lot of different fronts, of course. When it came to our school facilities, a number of things quickly jumped out to me. We have six rather, uh, rather dated elementary schools and then again, well, have been well maintained by the town. Um, they're they're dated, and they certainly don't uh, they don't best support teaching and learning in the current times. And by dated again, I don't mean shiny and new, but dated, and they just they they can't provide the appropriate spaces to support teaching and learning in these times uh, as much as much has changed since they were originally built. But I think it's important to point out that this wasn't just my impression um, as uh, as your new superintendent. Um, but the town's recently completed facilities master plan, completed in 2018, highlighted this exact same thing and identified a host of infrastructure needs that the community was required to attend to if they intended to continue to support the operations of the six elementary schools. It also very clearly outlined a recommendation to pursue or explore school consolidation of some sort based upon the numerous challenges in operating so many schools. And this 
apparently was heard time and time again through that facility's master plan process. It was with this understanding that I approached the then town manager, Mr. Hall, about seeking support to bring about improvements in the school facilities and apply to the MSBA grant program. We ultimately secured the support necessary of the school committee and the select board to submit those applications, which Mr. Hull and I did uh, for all six elementary schools in 2020 during the height of COVID. Eventually, out of 70 plus applications, we were one of a handful of communities invited in, for it became very clear to the MSBA that not just because of the Wildwood, but with all of our elementary schools, we had significant needs for improvement. Part of our application was to also designate one priority project, which we did, and that was the Wildwood School. As part of our application, we also very clearly signaled to the MSBA that we had an interest to explore school consolidation, specifically including the Wuhan Street, as well as the North. Next uh, slide, Jason, please. It is important to note for members that are uh, tuning in that in the process of being accepted in the MSBA, communities such as ours have to certify what's called certify enrollment for future uh, for future, future school designs. This is a very methodical process in which the MSBA and, and our district came to agreement on what our realistic projections were for future elementary enrollment. As a result, these numbers that you see here reflect the enrollment that we now have on file with the MSBA for any one of the three possible school designs or configurations. And so to speak, these enrollments are locked in and can't change. This is an important piece to note for as we're going through this design process, we're using these enrollment numbers uh, as the basis around which the size of schools uh, in this preliminary design phase are structured. So um, as mentioned, this, uh, this project has clear, very clearly signaled uh, to the MSBA uh, the interest that we have in exploring uh, the bringing together of grades in one project uh, or school consolidation. And we're curious the thoughts of those in attendance this evening. The question you can see on the screen. Again, we'll give this just a moment <clears throat> while people uh, respond, but to describe what's happening on the screen, the circles that you see on each line are the averages of all of the responses for each one of the three grade configurations. But the light color that you see behind is the spread that is occurring. So for example, in the pre-K only um, prompt, because there's a significant portion of the blue area that is on the left-hand side of the scale, there's a lot of agreement in that um, 1.2 um, average. Similarly, with the pre-K-5, there seems to be a lot of agreement on the should strongly consider end of the, <clears throat> of the scale. But for the pre-K-3, even though the average is currently showing, um, you know, about two and a half, because the, the light color behind is more evenly distributed, there isn't a lot of agreement uh, on how strongly the district should consider that particular prompt. Again, just for those watching uh, in real time, uh, I'm looking at a total of 77 participants who are tuned in um, here on this Zoom meeting. And it looks like Jason, we have just a one or 60, is that right? Are those numbers accurate there who, um, who have casted a, a response to this question? Yes, correct. Uh, uh, 54 responses on this right now. Looks like they have started to slow down, so we'll move on to um, the next schedule slide. So with that, we'll turn it over to Julie again, uh, the town's owner's project manager on this project, uh, Julie LeDuc from SMMA. Julie? Thank you. Uh, Wildwood was accepted into the MSBA program in April of 2021. The MSBA process is divided up into eight modules as shown on your screen. Each module is a checkpoint with the MSBA before proceeding on to the next phase. Next slide. Overall, this process can take up to seven years. We are currently in module three, the feasibility study.
As part of our comprehensive approach, our process timeline and stage of implementation are very strategic. The discovery process is the first phase and lays the foundation beginning with the facility reviews and educational analysis. Along the way, our ongoing working group meetings and public meetings scheduled where findings and updates are reported and the educational vision and options are refined. Starting this spring and into the summer, we will refine and analyze a short list of options towards a preferred option with continued input from the community and stakeholders. Deme development of the selected options will reflect the principles established in the previous phases and will confirm the cost impacts. Um, that will be voted on by the both the MSBA and the Town of Wilmington to continue forward with the desired project. We are looking for a town vote in approximately April of 2025. So currently in the phase that we're in, we are looking to submit our PDP, which is the preferred design program. The tasks and decisions are listed here. Define the project square footage, test the feasibility of the concepts, develop conceptual cost estimates, and identify preferred alternatives. They must include all three grade configurations, which is pre-KK, pre-K3 and pre-K5, and must include at least one of each a repair, a renovation addition, and new construction. Once the project funding is approved, the design is developed for construction. Our project completion date is estimated for 2028 to the 2029. In the first phase of the feasibility study, the design team evaluated the existing school facilities and sites that are part of this project. We reviewed three school locations, Wildwood, Woburn Street, and North Intermediate. Ideally, we wanna understand the potential limitations and the opportunities at each location. In general, the buildings are of similar vintage, but the sizes of the sites do vary as you can see on the screen. This became evident when we began the site design and layouts for the multiple options study that we'll be sharing later in this presentation. In summary, the facilities are maintained and currently operational. However, it's inevitable infrastructure upgrades may be limited without a major project to meet the current codes and ideally the educational vision in Wilmington. This school project is being shaped around the desire of our community, our staff, our parents, guardians, and community members at large. And I wanna take a few moments to talk a little bit about the process that has brought us to this point in the project. We started the school year off in September, putting out a call for volunteers far and wide to give up their time and help our design team in capturing feedback and ideas of what our community's vision was or is for the future of education at the elementary level in Wilmington. I have to say that I was thrilled and overwhelmed by the level of interest we had with well over 50 participants who stepped forward, knowing that it was going to be four different meetings for uh, a large number of hours but many responded to this call and to help, and we did not turn a single person away who wanted to share their ideas and their feedback. And I think that's a, a great thing um, that our community can be proud of. This group met on four different dates in September and October. Throughout our four meetings, an awful lot of information was gathered by Doran Whittier through various tools, including the one that's used uh, this evening. Based upon, uh, based upon the feedback through these four meetings, there were some key takeaways or outcomes at a very high level that are captured here on this slide. I won't read through them all, but the key, the key phrases or terms you can see are highlighted. But just very briefly, such things as a clear preference for pre-K to grade five school configuration as the ultimate project was conveyed. A recognition that a new school has to look and feel different in responding to student needs, as well as supporting teacher strengths. 
The need for the new building to be flexible and to have flexible spaces to adjust over the life of the school. Key takeaway was to organize with smaller grade level communities with a particular uh, with a particular note of not trying to uh, to trying sorry to meaningfully separate the younger from the older students. To have a new school that is welcome, purposeful, and helps build a school that feels connected to and with between the community and those that occupy it, as well as the clear identification of need. But there needs to be an acknowledgement by everyone that there are building improvements needed at all six elementary schools. And there's a strong desire to know the plan for the schools that not are that are not eventually included in this Wildwood School Building Project. So one of the things to, to note with the work to date at this at this very preliminary stage, you can see here, um, uh, separates out the space planning. Uh, with these three different divisions, pre-K to K, pre-K to three, and pre-K to five. And just a note again, for those that are tuning in and watching, um, our commitment with MSBA is obligated to have Doran Whittier explore all of these three options. Uh, a determination or a decision has not been made yet. And because of that, uh, there, is a, a, there is an absolute need to explore all of them. And so the working team over the last number of weeks and months has been doing just that. What this slide shows are guidelines um, that the MSBA has for a size of the population. Remember, I talked about that earlier, um, that, these, that this project is shaping around. It's important to note that the MSBA project will reimburse space for all but the pre-K level. Um, I'm sorry, that right? the guidelines are not capturing the pre-K level, but they will reimburse for the pre-K level. In all three cases, we are proposing at the current time more square footage than we currently have in our existing schools because of the fact that the educational needs of students have changed since that time. You also see um, uh, as you get up in the size of the building uh, that with more grades, there's more efficiency in the building space design in terms of the square footage perspective. The reason that the pre-K five option right now is slightly less efficient though, is because we are currently planning for a full size high school gymnasium. And we'll talk further about that in the later slide. One final piece to note here, and, and Jason, help me out if I'm uh, not completely accurate with this, but the square footage that this project is carrying right now, the uh, third column from the left, uh, the proposed square footage um, is larger than the MSBA guidelines because of the fact that we are also shaping these buildings to include the pre-kindergarten level, is that correct? That, that's exactly right, Glenn. There, there are other elements that are being proposed that are also deviations from the MSBA guidelines, but they're the result of the specific programs and services, um, the operational practices that are happening here in Wilmington um, that happen to deviate from the assumptions the MSBA's guidelines are based on. Uh, next slide, Jason, thanks. Um, what this slide shows is uh, is a, is a diagrammatically um, the overall uh, results of the information captured through the visioning process. And from visioning, the relationships here are highlighted between the individual pieces and parts, if you will, of each grade level configuration. So in reality, this diagram exists for and supports all three grade level configuration possibilities, 3K to K, pre-K to three and pre-K to grade five. The big picture message here, um, that there really are three big zones that are being considered. And again, this is happening because of the feedback of the 50 plus participants who helped uh, provide their input. Those three big zones, a pre-K to grade two zone or area of a building, uh, a pre uh, grade three to five zone, if it was a pre-K to five building, as well as shared elements in the middle. And those shared elements are such things as dining or cafeteria space, uh, gymnasium space, art, music, and so on. And for all three of these, uh, th again, these are the, the, uh, the, the information that was taken from the vision and, and these are the, the tools or the building blocks, if you will, um, that are helping uh, guide the project direction. Um, put into uh, to words, the feedback that was gathered through the visioning process is captured in these next two slides. Uh, again, the visioning work was key and fundamental in laying the groundwork for um, the building or buildings are starting to take shape in this design phase. 
The participants help in developing what we've been calling guiding principles, the design of a new facility, or that new facility, of course, could also be renovation or addition. Following slides capture this, and it's becoming a source document, if you will, that our work team returns to continuously. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but um, uh, you can see the, the key phrases that are highlighted and that pop out. Uh, and these are the design principles that uh, we come back to again and again in our So using the um, space summaries that have been developed, as well as all of the feedback and information we've gathered through the visioning sessions and the guiding principles that have developed from that, we as a design team start developing the design options. This matrix shows the number of options that we will be pursuing through this process. The pre-KK, pre-K3, and pre-K5 are the three great configurations that we'll be looking at to move forward into the next phase. But within that, we will also be shortlisting through this process um, at least one repair option, which has no educational improvements, but is more or less a um, code, uh, adjusting codes and repairing and renovating the buildings um, as is. Then add renos, options that will look at um, renovating portions of the building, of the existing buildings, and then um, having additions onto those buildings to meet the educational goals and visions that we have established through the previous process. And then also looking at new options um, through the different sites and um, moving those forward. So we would have to use one repair, one ad reno, and one new option um, to move forward into the next phase, as well as um, one option within each of the three grade configurations. Overall, there are 18 options that we are looking at. Today, we'll be um, reviewing 15 of those options. The ones that we won't review are the repair only because there's really no diagram um, to represent that but it will be um, used as a baseline as we move forward um, to review cost uh, up in an upcoming presentation. Ronnie, could you take just a minute and explain what the not applicables are in this matrix? Oh, sure. So for example, um, there are three options uh, or boxes, if you will, with uh, that are not applicable to us. So for example, at the Woburn Street site, um, the building is an existing uh, grades one, two, and three um, enrollment. And for us to move pre-KK to that site, they would actually be in a separate building, which would mean there would be two buildings on one site. So for our purposes here, we did not think that was um, a viable option. Um, and so we have looked at all of the options um, and sites available and determined that if there were two buildings that would end up being on one site, it would not be um, uh, an option that would be studied and move forward. So um, at Woburn Street, as we mentioned, um, the pre-KK only option would not be studied. At the North Intermediate site, uh, pre-KK and pre-K three would not be studied because it would not um, address the needs of the fourth and fifth grade that are existing on that North Intermediate site. So just to give you an understanding of the scale of the process that we're in right now, um, we're in the preliminary design program phase. And here we're trying to define the project. We're exploring the widest range of options possible, but um, ultimately we will narrow down those options into a single option, but that will be in the next phase. So right now we're going from the many to the few and in the next phase, we will look at going from the few to the preferred option. Um, in this phase, we're looking to more or less answer these questions. Are we accomplishing the educational goals? Are we accomplishing the um, infrastructure and um, building requirements and goals that we have set as, um, as that we have set for this process? 
Um, we're also looking to see, does it fit on the sites? As you know, there are four sites that we are looking at. Each of them vary in size. Each of them have different um, uh, restrictions and limitations, which we will review um, in a minute. But um, our, does the gray configuration that, and the size of the building that we're looking to fit on a site fit and is it appropriate? And then also we're looking to get feedback. Um, what are we doing? What are we proposing? And what could we be doing better? Here we have the different sites under consideration, just to give you an overview. Um, for this project, this MSBA project, we're allowed to look at the Wildwood, Woburn, and North Intermediate site. The Town Hall site has also been identified and so is also included here um, under the list of sites under consideration. Um, different factors that we look at are whether or not there's access to municipal um, sewer. Is there natural gas? Are there topography challenges that we need to consider? Um, what are we able to fit on the site um, based on the acreage available? Also, are there any limitations, for example, on the town hall site? Um, there are potential Article 97 protections on the site. So all of those are factors that we will look at um, as we consider each of these sites um, to move forward. This is the existing conditions of the North Intermediate site. To note here is that it's a 14 acre site. The existing building is on the Southeast corner of the site. And that is also where you'll see the entrance and parking. And then the North um, West portions of the site uh, have mostly the green spaces and fields. There's also a wetlands on the Southwest section of the site. Um, the wetlands themselves just buffer and touch the um, property line. And then there is a hundred foot wetlands buffer that we will have to um, try to not impact as part of the project. Another feature that we should also note is that there is an elevation change and that, thank you, Jason, sorry, um, that there is an elevation change from the um, south portion of the property line that goes towards the um, center of the site and it's approximately 10 feet of elevation change that we will factor in as we are studying the site. And all of this, um, the reason why we look at all of the information here is to determine what the buildable area is on a site. Um, the area that is marked by this yellow hatch pattern is more or less the area that we can start looking at to build um, either an addition or a new, have new construction without fully impacting the existing building and trying to limit our impact on the wetlands. At the Woburn Street site, it's a 10 acre site. Um, there is uh, a groundwater protection district that is part of this site, which is that purple area that you're seeing on the site towards the north end of the site. Um, we can still build in that area. However, um, we have to be um, mindful of what we are putting on um, into the ground and how that is filtered. The existing building is on the east edge of the site and the west side of the site has um, a lot of fields and play area. There's a significant grade change um, on the site that we will use, that will be factored. Um, on the south end of the site, there's a 25 foot elevation change, as many of you may know if you've been to the site. And on the north portion of the site, there's a 15 foot elevation change that we will um, consider as we look at options for this site. So the buildable area without disturbing the existing building would be um, more or less anywhere on the site since there are no wetlands um, impacting the site. At the Wildwood site, this is uh, significantly smaller compared to the other two sites at seven and a half acres. Um, there is an elevation change um, that will be factored in here. Um, the center of the site tends to be high and um, it, tends to slope 
um, downward um, as you get to the property, property line. Um, this site, uh, as, and I should have mentioned this on the other ones, but um, with the Wildwood site, it's on municipal water, but it is on um, a septic system. And that is the same at the Woburn Street site. Um, the North Intermediate site is actually um, on um, municipal sewer. And here you can also see that on the north edge of the site, it touches the buffer of the wetlands and there is a wellhead protection area that also runs along the north end of the site. So for the buildable area, you can see that more or less the entire site is buildable. This is because the existing building is actually not occupied at the moment. And so if we were to start a project on this site, um, whether it was a renovation or a demolition, the entire site could be utilized since we would not be impacting students. The last site that we are looking at is the town hall site. This is the biggest of the four sites at 19 acres. Um, and there is a wetlands um, buffer on the east side of, the, uh, on the west side of the site. Um, Lover's Brook runs along that northwest property line. And so we will be mindful of that because with that buffer is the Article 97. And so that is something that we are looking to further study. Um, also to note for this site is that it is on municipal water and sewer. And right now, more or less with that, as long as we don't touch the buffer area, the, the entire site is a buildable area um, because a new town hall is um, under construction for um, the town and um, that building potentially will be empty. Thanks, Ronnie. As we transition into the options themselves, we're gonna start with the pre-K five grade configuration um, not suggesting that it's, it's preferred or that any decisions have been made. As we've communicated in other meetings, the pre-K five grade configuration simply is the largest possible building that we're test fitting on these sites. <clears throat> so we've developed these first um, because they're the most uh, constrained. And then we worked our way sort of a subtractive method through the other grade configurations uh, with similar approaches. What you're seeing on this particular slide is a reminder that we're talking about a population of 755 students grades K through five, and then the project would support um, additional pre-K students over and above that 755 number. On the left-hand side of this slide, what you're seeing in the little squares is a representation of all of the individual spaces that are currently under consideration for this grade configuration, and they represent um, <clears throat> the elements that we've used to develop these concepts so that we could be assured that every uh, piece was represented. It's important to note that for this particular grade configuration, um, two things are uh, different than some of the other grade configurations. First, um, the district is considering um, starting a new STEM program at the elementary level. And so there are spaces associated with that program in this sequence of, of concepts. And similarly, as Dr. Brand mentioned a few moments ago, um, this particular grade configuration is proposing a high school sized gymnasium, uh, primarily as a community resource. And uh, I'll, I'll let Dr. Brand talk about that for just a moment. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, just to expand upon that, um, first I'll back up to the STEM program, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, obviously, I think many who are in tune to a degree, even as a parent guardian with education now, know the critical importance of, of, of STEM as a particular component or aspect of supporting uh, young people's development. Um, it is not at all uncommon uh, if we were to have the chance to visit uh, newer, uh, newly designed schools that there are dedicated space that provides uh, a far different environment than a regular or traditional classroom environment. Uh, with equipment and machinery and so on to help support that program. And so um, that is the STEM program aspect that we're considering. As far as the high school gymnasium, uh, if school consolidation occurs and we end up closing a school or schools, um, there, there's nothing at this point in time, as I understand it, that's been determined yet by the town in terms of what may happen to vacated buildings. 
Uh, it's the understanding that there will be uh, a committee formed, a building reuse committee, I believe is the name of that committee. Um, but because of the uncertainty of that, uh, our initial planning has included incorporating a high school sized gym into a pre-K to five option. Uh, we, we recognize that if, for example, the pre-K to five option emerged and say the uh, North and Woburn Street schools closed, that would take offline gym space that's currently used for parks and recreation programming. So with that, uh, another effort to gather the feedback for those that are in attendance. Again, I want to thank what I see is uh, just shy of 80 people who are uh, still on the call here. Um, if you could take a moment on the Mentimeter platform, uh, share your feedback with regards to this question. And while that's taking place, uh, we'll just remind folks if you're if you're joining the meeting um, just recently in the chat, we do have the web address and the code necessary to access the Mentimeter platform so that you can provide your feedback uh, in real time. Looks like we're still getting a uh, response. We've got about half of the total participants uh, responding so far. And what appears to be emerging, at least from this uh, particular group of participants, is that uh, there may be real value in having um, a high school sized gymnasium associated with this uh, great configuration and this potential project, even if, uh, or, or regardless of what um, potentially happens at any buildings that are remaining. We'll let this go for just a, uh, another few seconds to see if the responses have slowed down. And it appears that they have. So thank you everyone for your feedback on that issue. So as we transition into the concepts themselves, I'll just remind everyone that as Ronnie mentioned, uh, it's important to not get too weighed down into the details here we're just still right at the beginning um, of this of this project, and there's still lots of opportunity for things to shift a bit, to move a bit, to, to respond to feedback. Um, and so we're gonna try to communicate all of these options at a relatively high level of detail. So let me first walk everyone through sort of what the content of each slide will be, and then I'll walk um, through some of the site basic site features of each one of the options in particular. So what you're seeing in the left-hand part of the slide is an overall site plan. In this case, we are looking at the North Intermediate site. Um, you'll see a white polygon, a white shape that represents an approximate building footprint for this particular concept. You'll see a couple of um, triangles. The red triangle in all of our slides represent where the main entry would be. The small triangle represents where a potential pre-K entry would be. Um, anytime you're seeing a heavy dashed line, um, that's representing the demolition of an existing building. On the right hand side of the slide, what we're trying to convey in the in the construction phasing text is sort of how complicated it might be to execute this particular concept. Um, we won't go through each individual step, um, but we would invite you to sort of realize that the more lines there are, the more steps there are the more complicated and likely the longer the construction phasing would be. In the middle of that uh, sort of uh, right-hand side of the slide is a, a, simple, a simplified diagram of what portion of the concept is um, new construction, either additions or freestanding uh, construction, and what portion as indicated in orange uh, is renovation. And then finally, in the bottom part of this right-hand slide are thumbnail diagrams um, that have uh, a representation of the individual floor plans in each concept. And what we would encourage you to focus on is uh, not where individual pieces and parts are, but only that we have attempted to articulate where every piece is. And you should read how many floors each option is because they do vary um, from concept to concept. So what we have here, uh, what we're calling pre-K five and option N1, is an all new construction on the fields um, of the North Intermediate site. We've got a series of parking and roadways, um, site amenities like playgrounds, outdoor learning space, a little bit of field space, 
but let me first just walk you through sort of how the site works in this concept. Buses um, and parents would both enter down here along Salem Street. They would move in toward the site. Parent vehicles would peel off and load and unload uh, students along this, um, this loop in front of the main entry. And then they would circulate back out and head back out towards Salem Street. Buses, although they're entering in the same location, would veer left and circulate around the building. And they would load and unload along this set of sidewalks also near the main entry. And the assumption is that students would all um, go in the front door, or in this case, they may enter also in a cafeteria door that happens to be where my cursor is. Buses would then exit out the site up along Ballard Vale, Ave, uh, up along Ballard vale Street. This main parking lot up front would be assumed to be for um, faculty and staff. There's another parking lot along this sidewalk and visitor parking would likely be located in a portion of that. We have some hardscape play. We have grade level playgrounds sort of inside the circulation loop. We have two field areas, a small one to the Northwest and a slightly larger one between the parent loop and the parking. Neither of these areas is large enough to accommodate sort of regulation fields, um, but we're operating under the assumption that there may be opportunity to replicate any lost fields on a, on a concept like this in one of the other two sites that are being vacated in a pre-K-5 uh, concept. It is a three-story option. We would assume that pre-K and K are on the ground, one and two are on the second floor, and then three, four, and five are on the third floor. Moving on, this is the same North Intermediate site. This, however, is an addition renovation option, what we're calling Pre-K-5 AR1. And again, you see the, the uh, footprint of the project here. What's being explored is retaining the core of the existing building and then essentially putting a, a multi-story addition all the way around that. Um, I'll just highlight that there's far more um, steps in the construction phasing than in an all new construction uh, scenario. And essentially the way that would work is that you would build an addition, you would move into it, you would vacate the existing building, you would renovate the existing building, and then you would bring everyone over um, once the project is fully complete. One advantage that this concept has over the previous one is that the green space is more contiguous, still not likely to be able to support full-size regulation fields, um, but may support uh, playgrounds and some more open green space. The way the site works in this concept is parent vehicles would enter along Salem Street and they would load and unload along the front of the building and then exit back out uh, to Salem Street. Buses would enter at uh, Ballard Vale and they would circulate through the main faculty and staff parking lot. And then they would load and unload along the northern edge uh, of the building and enter that from a different direction. And then the buses would exit back out um, to Ballard Vale. It's important to note about this particular concept because of all of the existing level changes in the existing building and the topography that Ronnie mentioned just a few moments ago, this particular concept turns out to be a four story concept. So we would have kindergarten on the lowest level. We would have pre-kindergarten and first grade on the main level. We would have second and third grade on the uh, second floor. And then we would have fourth and fifth grade um, on the uppermost floor. Shifting over now to uh, the Woburn Street site. Again, remember that we've got um, a lot of topography to deal with here. And I'll just note that there's a new graphic in this particular concept. Ronnie mentioned that both Woburn Street and the Wildwood properties are on septic systems. So what you're seeing in these light green areas are not fields, but they are leaching areas for the septic system. So what's being proposed here is a three-story all new construction on the northernmost, what is the widest portion of the site. And your first observation will notice that it overlaps part of the existing building. So in terms of the construction phasing, what appears to be necessary to put a building of this size in this place on the site, we'd actually have to demolish the existing 
uh, gymnasium and the few classroom spaces that exist below it in the first step, which means the occupants of the existing Woburn Street building would not have access to those spaces during construction. The main parking lot is up on the upper level. Um, the playgrounds, uh, septic fields, and some of the outdoor learning areas are all on the lowest level, and then the building um, spans both of those levels. So parent vehicles, um, K through five uh, parents would likely enter through this faculty parking lot, load and unload near the front door, and then exit out the same way that they arrived uh, out to Woburn Street. Pre-K parents, um, there's an opportunity for, here for them to go down the hill and have their own loading and unloading area on the lowest level with their own dedicated entry uh, down there on the ground. Um, there may even be an opportunity to provide some dedicated pre-K parking so that for students that need that parent, be, parents could park and walk their children um, to the front door. Uh, those parent vehicles would then turn around and exit back out the way they came. Buses, however, would enter that same route, but then circulate all the way around the building and then load and unload on this eastern edge uh, near the front door before exiting the site back out to High Street. One last thing that we'll note about this particular concept, because of all of the topography and elevation change that's present, in order to make the site circulation and some of the leaching fields work, it's likely that this site is going to require some extensive retaining walls indicated here by these heavy black lines, some here on the north, um, others here along the, the slope of the hill between the, the main parking lot and the uh, playgrounds and, and leaching fields below. For those of you that are reacting to each of these using the heart, thumbs up and th thumbs down button, uh, we appreciate that feedback. Although we're not taking any, any votes on this tonight, we do uh, value that feedback. So we encourage you to continue to do that. This is also the Woburn Street site. Um, this, however, is an addition renovation uh, concept, what we're calling Pre-K-5 AR for addition renovation two. And again, the you'll see the building footprint there. It sort of looks like an upside down U or an H, uh, lowercase h perhaps. Um, what's being retained is uh, two thirds of the existing building. The only portion that's not remaining is the existing cafeteria kitchen to the southern end, uh, and then a large addition um, that marches down the hill. In terms of uh, parent and uh, vehicular circulation, parent vehicles would enter along High Street, load and unload along the eastern edge of the concept, and then exit back out. Um, to Woburn Street. There are two primary faculty parking lots, so they would enter the north part of the site from High Street, um, either park in this upper parking lot or um, head all the way down to the lower parking lot. Buses would enter from the south along Woburn Street, head down the hill, load and unload along the edge, the lowest uh, level of the building, and then use a hardscape play area to turn around and then exit back out the way they came. This is a three-story concept with uh, pre-K and K on the ground. Um, one, two, and three, excuse me, one and two on the main level, and then three, four, and five up on the <clears throat> upper level. Most of the core elements, the cafeteria, the library, art, music are all in the, uh, in the existing building that has been repurposed for those functions. Finally, moving over to the Wildwood site. This is a three-story, all-new construction. Um, the primary thing that we'll highlight here is that this is an awful lot of program and building to put on such a small site. In fact, because of the topography, the first thing I'll note is that there's this extensive retaining wall on two complete sides of the property in order to get the parking and site circulation playgrounds um, as limited as they are on the same level as the as the proposed building. You'll see that the leaching fields for this population are, are being squeezed in between uh, the emergency vehicle loop and the north eastern edge of the property line. In this case, this is all new construction, so the existing building is being demolished. 
parent vehicles would enter here from the northwest. They would make an immediate right-hand turn, circulate through the parking lot, and then load and unload along the front of the building before exiting out uh, the way they came. There is an opportunity for pre-K vehicles to load and unload along this edge and a little turnaround so that they could um, go through another parking lot and then exit back out the way they came. And then buses, again, would circumnavigate the building. They would, they would load and unload um, on this northeastern edge and then exit back out the way, they, the way they came. In this particular diagram, we were not able to achieve the levels of separation from parent vehicles uh, and bus vehicles um, that were desired, nor able to achieve the number of parking spaces uh, that we would think would be necessary for this population. We do have pre-K and K on the first floor, one and two on the second floor, and three, four, and five on the third floor. In terms of construction phasing, because there are no students here, um, this is the cleanest uh, phasing possible. The entire building and site could be completed and then everyone move in once everything is, is finished. Staying with the Wildwood site, um, this is a now an addition renovation concept, what we're calling Pre-K-5 AR-3. You see the building shape is a little different. What's being proposed is a renovation of the portion of the existing building that faces Wildwood Street with a big addition um, to the Northeast. Again, parent vehicles would circulate similar to what we saw where they would make the right-hand turn and circulate in front of the building before exiting. Um, Pre-K students, again, <clears throat> could be loaded and unloaded near their door, and then parent vehicles exit back out the way they came, and then buses, again, circulating all the way around. <clears throat> the grade configuration, uh, excuse me, the grade level groupings, Pre-K and K on the ground, uh, first and second grade on the second floor, and then three, four, and five in a grouping on the third floor. <clears throat> and then finally moving over to the town hall site, which happens to be the largest um, of the parcels uh, under consideration, just to orient folks, Glen Road is over here. And um, what you're seeing is um, sort of a capital H shaped footprint and the existing town hall building is dotted in. It does happen to be a circular building. Um, there are a couple of known potential challenges with this site, one being the number and size of access points. Uh, so the primary access point would be here along Glen Road, and there have already been concerns expressed by members of the school building committee and the, um, the leadership group about traffic on, potential traffic on Glen Road. But the concept here is that everyone would enter the site from Glen Road, parent vehicles would take a left-hand turn and circulate to the back of the building and load and unload along the northwestern edge. Um, turn around and exit back out the way they came. Buses would also enter from Glen Road, but they would continue straight through the primary faculty parking lot around this bus turnaround and then use the entire front to the south east uh, of the concept to load and unload near the front door before exiting back out the way they came. You'll notice that there's a small parking lot here. Um, again, this is an effort to depict what could be a dedicated pre-K parking lot, again, where parents could park and walk their children to the pre-K portion of the concept. In this case, um, it's a much safer condition than what we saw perhaps over at the, the Woburn Street site, because uh, once parents are parked, it's a protected path. Um, they don't have to cross over any roads to get to that particular door. You also see that what's being depicted on this north edge is a, another parking lot, potentially associated with replicated fields in what is currently the wooded area uh, to the north. This rectangle isn't meant to suggest any particular kind of field. Uh, we included it in this diagram simply for scale. What's being represented is a full competition football field, just to give you a sense of how much space is back there. Also depicted are a few pickleball courts. The last thing that we'll say about this particular concept um, in terms of the site is that we're showing a connection to this residential neighborhood um, on the eastern boundary. From a safety and security point of view, it's often advantageous to have more than one access point 
So if this were to get uh, pursued further, we would imagine that this is a gated condition for emergency vehicles only, that we wouldn't be expecting buses or parent vehicles to be entering or exiting the site uh, from that location through the adjacent neighborhood. In terms of the floor plans themselves, uh, one of the unique features of this particular concept is of all the concepts we've looked at so far, this is the only one that's two stories. So we've got pre-K and K on the ground in these two fingers. We've got first grade and second grade stacked on top of them. And then on the other side, we've got um, three and four in each one of these fingers and then potentially fifth grade uh, up on the second floor. As we move over into the pre-K three alternatives, again here, the diagram to the left represents all of the pieces and parts. And unlike what we saw with pre-K five uh, explorations, uh, the proposal is for an elementary size gym, which is essentially half the size uh, of a full high school gymnasium. This would be serving 510 students K through five with additional pre-K students over and above that number. Uh, STEM program space um, was also proposed for this grade grouping. So if you remember back to the matrix, Ronnie talked about the, the not applicable squares. We're starting at the Woburn Street site here because we would not attempt to execute a second freestanding building on the North Intermediate site because it would be assumed that four and five would have to stay in the existing building. So we're starting here at the, uh, at the Woburn Street site. Again, we're looking at uh, a concept in the northernmost part of the site. Um, it is a two-story concept because we have two fewer grades here. And then another feature that we'll, um, that we'll share is that based on feedback, there was a desire to explore concepts that did not overlap the existing building. So because we have fewer students in this concept, we were able to push um, the proposed project uh, north far enough to get it off of the existing building, which means it could be built free and clear. And the students currently occupying the Woburn Street facility would have full use of that facility during construction. Many of the other features that we saw in a previous concept remain the same. We have extensive retaining walls because of the topography, both on the north and on the south sides of the concept. Parent uh, circulation would work very similar to what we saw before with one grouping potentially dropping off at the upper level, another grade grouping dropping off at the lower level and then exiting back out to Woburn Street. Buses um, circulating all the way around the building and then exiting out to High Street. In this case, um, there's a unique feature that we haven't seen in any of the concepts yet. We do have pre-K and K on the lowest level of the site and of the building. Um, but we've got one, two, and three on the main level, but they form this donut with what is a closed courtyard on the main level, but an open courtyard down below. So this one grade level grouping is serving as a, essentially a bridge, a connector that's hovering above this hardscape play area um, that could be perceived as an advantage, um, providing some shelter um, over a hardscape play area in inclement uh, weather. Um, it is a little more expensive to build building uh, up in the air like that, um, but it does achieve the grade level grouping relationships uh, that were desired coming out of visioning. Because the building and the concept does not overlap the existing building, the construction phasing is a little simpler. You could build all of the all of the concept in one step, move um, the first through third graders in that building, knock down the existing building, complete the site work, and then once everything is completed, move everyone else uh, over. Same grade configuration, same site. This, however, is an addition renovation scenario. It's very similar to what we saw for the pre-K five, um, except that the new addition is one story less. So instead of having a three-story academic portion, uh, in this case, we have a two-story academic portion, even though the existing building uh, would remain three stories. <clears throat> Because of the tightness of the site, um, we've got leaching fields you know, under the bus turnaround. We have a much shorter parent drop-off zone here along High Street and Woburn Street. Buses, in this case, would circulate behind the building, turn around, and then exit back out the way they came. Again, two faculty parking lots, an upper one, 
and a lower one uh, separated by a fairly extensive retaining wall on both sides. In this case, we have that same sort of hovering condition that we talked about a moment ago, but in this case, it's this grade level grouping um, that opens up to the south. You can see it a little bit here in the floor plan diagrams. Much more complicated construction phasing here where the new addition would have to be built. Uh, students move in, renovate the existing building, uh, complete the site work, and then not move the pre-KK students in until all of that work is completed. Moving over to the Wildwood site, we're seeing some similar geometries here, but again, it's, it's fewer students. So instead of a three-story concept, um, it could be a two-story concept. Again, real challenges with the topography, extensive retaining walls are likely necessary. You can see the, um, the leaching fields for the septic system that would be required. Um, because it is fewer students, we have a little more green space, a little more opportunity for outdoor play or outdoor learning and, and playgrounds. The site circulation works very similar to what we have seen with the other concepts on this property. Parent vehicles out front, potential for pre-K vehicles. Uh, along the side, and then the buses needing to circulate all the way around the building before exiting. And then very similar, this is an addition renovation scenario with many of the same features, but in this case, um, what we would be saving is the, again, the portion of the existing building that faces uh, Wildwood Street, building a major addition behind it. Pre-K and K on the ground, one, two, and three, along with uh, some core elements like the library on the second floor. And then finally, this concept over at the town hall, the site organization is very similar. Um, the key difference between the pre-K three version of this and the pre-K five version of this is that um, in terms of the floor plans, um, Three of the four fingers were two stories in the pre-K-5 concept. In this case, um, three of the four fingers are one story. So we've got pre-K and K on the ground, um, <clears throat> one and two uh, on the ground on the other side with only grade three potentially up on the second floor. And then finally, shifting into our last uh, grade configuration and groupings of options. Again, we've got fewer students and fewer spaces in these concepts, about a 67,000 square foot concept at the moment, but it would have both um, space for a STEM program and in this case, again, an elementary school size gym. We're talking about 130 students for kindergarten and then um, pre-K students over and above that. Because the other two schools would need to remain in existence, we're only exploring um, this grade configuration on the Wildwood site and the Town Hall site. So here, the first thing you see is a, um, an all new construction on the Wildwood site. And while there's more green space um, and it's a single story concept, because of the grade change, um, it would be difficult to provide access to some of those lower levels for functional use of either playgrounds or field space. So again, you're seeing a lot of retaining wall um, wrapping around some of the site features. Because it is fewer grades, the parking better aligns with um, what we would expect in terms of faculty, staff, and visitors. Uh, and we do have, um, in this case, parent vehicles entering from the south and coming straight across the front of the building before exiting. Um, there is a little lay line here for pre-K vehicles um, turning around and exiting out uh, to the north. And then any buses or specialized transportation we might have would again circulate around the back of the building uh, before coming out. Unlike any of the previous options, um, one of the things that is occurring here is there is a, an enclosed courtyard in the concept for this particular grade configuration that may be perceived as an advantage. You can imagine outdoor learning or even playground space in that uh, sort of more sheltered, more protected environment that's surrounded by, uh, surrounded by building. Here's a version of that um, that is an, an ad reno. Uh, we apologize, there is a graphic error here. Um, there should be orange represented here at the front of the building uh, where we're keeping the portion of the existing building that's facing Wildwood Street. 
but the remaining organization of the concept is very similar to what we just saw in all new construction. Again, a one-story co concept uh, with an enclosed courtyard to separate pre-K uh, from K. And I think this is the last concept. We appreciate your patience um, for us to work through all of these. This is that same new construction concept, but placed over at the town hall. You can see that it occupies much less of the site and there's potential for uh, replicating fields or introducing new fields uh, to the north. In this case, parent vehicles would enter, uh, make this left-hand turn and then circulate through this parking lot along the front of the building before exiting out. Um, buses again would circulate along the eastern edge of the property, um, turn around and load and unload. Uh, along what is the pre-K entry, that uh, southeastern edge of the concept before exiting back out uh, to Glen Road. That same sense of having an emergency vehicle access point um, exists over here to the residential neighborhood. And again, a single story concept um, that could be constructed in one phase. So here's a summary of all of those various concepts with the first floor floor plans turned on to sort of remind you um, what we just went through. And as Ronnie mentioned a moment ago, the school building committee has a responsibility over the next couple of months to identify the short list of alternatives that will move into the next step. And we need to have at least one concept from each grade configuration in that short list and then at least at least one, regardless of what grade configuration, um, one repair, one ad reno, and one new on that short list. One of the decisions that the MSBA will not allow the community to make at this particular moment is which is the preferred grade configuration. So we wanna just be clear with everyone about that. The level of consolidation um, will be decided actually in the second submittal, what's called the preferred schematic report submittal, when the district and the community identify the one preferred option um, that they're gonna move forward into schematic design. Glenn, you wanna? Sure, thank you, Jason. And thank you so much for taking us through uh, all of those options. And thank you folks for hanging in there. We know that this is an awful lot of information, um, but we certainly appreciate your, your patience and your attention. Uh, as you know, we're we're certainly we're committed to exploring school consolidation with this project. Um, and uh, before asking for your feedback, which we're going to do in just a moment here, let me take just a few minutes to highlight what uh, the benefits could be around school consolidation in no particular order. That is bringing together under one roof more than just the Wildwood School, which obviously is the priority of this project, and we have not lost sight of that at all. Uh, but the possibility of uh, merging or bringing together the pre-K, K along with the Woburn Street grades one and two uh, and three, or also adding the North, uh, resulting in a pre-K to five option that's been profiled here. Some of those advantages could include bringing educational uh, program advantages with more access to specialists when they're not divided amongst several buildings and better allow, better allow the coordination of programs and services. A chance to support improved student achievement and creating conditions uh, having students under one roof for a longer period of time. There is evidence out there that suggests that more years uh, in one place is beneficial for students and obviously better for their overall growth and development. Community advantages, certainly a possibility of one drop-off point for pa parents and guardians, knowledge of the school community and the policies and procedures uh, that uh, will uh, stay with them for a longer period of time. The time to realize improvements, having one project built to accommodate all staff and students of the two or three schools would certainly lead to the ability to more quickly bring about needed facility improvements. And certainly over the longer term for the town, uh, operational efficiencies, for example, only having one boiler or one set of boilers to maintain or one roof, et cetera. So with that, um, and for those right now, we have 66 members that are still on this call, 66 members of the community. Here's another question for Mentimeter. If I could ask you to go back to that, and we just have a couple more slides and then we're going to get to questions of which we have a number of them already tonight. So uh, thank you again for hanging in there. How strongly do you believe that the district and the town consider each level of school consolidation?
Great. Again, of, of the of the folks who have responded so far, what's being depicted in these results is that there's consensus that there's very little uh, preference for considering pre-KK only, um, sort of a mixed message around pre-K three, and a, a strong agreement um, that the district should strongly consider consolidating all three groupings uh, into into one facility as a pre-K five. And we'll give that just a few more seconds uh, to give folks an opportunity to respond. We've got 46 of the 65 respondents. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Ronnie? Ronnie, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> and thank you, Jason, for going through all of those options. I know it was a lot of information and, um, you know, the presentations are going to be available for you to go through them more slowly at your own pace. But we wanted to talk about the next step, which is evaluating the options. As mentioned, you just saw 15 of those options. In total, we have 18 options that we will be considering as part of this um, phase. And with that, we will be looking at various criteria to um, more or less rank each of the options to see which ones are the preferred options to move forward. So as I mentioned earlier, right now we have many options and we will, um, we will go down to a few options. And then in the next phase, we'll go from those few options to a single option that we will put forward. So these are the main categories that we will be looking to evaluate each of the options against. We will be looking at education, site, community, sustainability, the logistics of um, constructing whatever option and whatever building um, is preferred, how long it'll take to complete it, whether or not there's consolidation as part of that, um, whether we're doing a pre-KK, pre-K-3, or pre-K-5 and how that'll impact um, the neighborhood and the traffic. And then at the very end, we will look at the cost. Um, we'll be doing this in two parts over the next uh, month and a half. First, we will look at um, everything but cost. Um, and then uh, we will uh, introduce the cost to see what the impact is of knowing how much it will cost for each of those options and whether or not that changes um, whether an option is preferred. But I, I won't go through all of these, but this is just to give you a snapshot of um, the topics that we'll be looking at to um, create uh, a matrix, if you will, for evaluating each of these options to move forward. And what we're looking for from you is, based on what you just saw, if there's any ideas or concerns or topics that you think the district and town should consider for this project. Um, as we are working with the SB um, School Building Committee to um, develop the criteria that will be in the matrix to evaluate the options. We would love to hear your feedback on um, what we are considering and if there's anything that, that we might be missing that you think is important for us to know. We know this is an open-ended uh, question and responses should appear on the screen in real time as they're coming in. So we'll give folks just a moment or two. Um, what you're seeing on the screen is the, the responses that have come in is trying to organize them uh, into groupings. Okay, seeing lots of good feedback here.
safety and security, cost of getting things completed, bus transportation, questions about um, the remaining uh, schools that aren't gonna be addressed by this project. Right, questions around uh, cost both now and into the future. Value in a high school size gymnasium. Concern around the town hall site. Just a quick note about that. Um, there's no expectation from the MSBA that all sites under consideration move forward. So if for whatever reason there's a site that the, the, the community feels isn't worth exploring further, those could be eliminated um, as part of this first set of evaluations. Think about heating and cooling and air quality. Questions are about life cycle cost. Site logistics. Some great feedback and thank you everyone. Uh, we will compile these and, and again, as Jason said at the outset, I think uh, towards the beginning of the meeting, we'll leave this open for another week. I think it's the intention for those friends and neighbors, uh, colleagues that may have not had a chance to join tonight, they'll still have a chance to add their um, uh, their thoughts and feedback. Uh, the one prompt, there was a lot that grabbed my attention there, but the one around cost of perhaps not doing anything to a particular building or uh, a building that may not be included in the um, eventual new project, that will in due, in due time be uh, compiled and shared with the community as part of the existing conditions assessment. So certainly stay tuned for that, more, more to come. So um, we are uh, gonna wrap up here and then get to questions for those that wish to stay here and I see them coming in and we'll do our best uh, we know that it's it's been a long time for folks together. Thank you for hanging in there. We want you to stay connected. This is a community project. Um, it's not the school committees. It's not uh, the administrations. It is the community of Wilmington. And so with that, we are trying very hard to make sure that people who wish to stay informed and up to speed. There are a few ways that you can do this. The first is checking out the compilation of information that's presented on the school district's website. We have a whole dedicated page for this project. We compile and upload regularly meetings, recordings of meetings. Um, there's a lot of material and information there, uh, but we are trying to make this completely accessible for anyone um, in the community. A shout out and thanks to WCTV who continues to help us the best we can capture the recordings of all of our meetings, whether in person or remote. Um, next slide, uh, Jason, please. The um, uh, other piece to point out is that the Wildwood, the school building committee has been mentioned a number of times tonight, an important entity or, or or support for this project. All of those meetings are public. What this means is that the dates and the agendas are always posted in advance. And at each meeting, there is always an opportunity for anyone from the public and the community to provide their feedback or commentary. Um, and anyone at any time is welcome to visit those meetings, whether they are held in person or remote. You can see here on the screen the next dates for the building committee meetings that are scheduled. Another community forum is planned uh, in March to share costs for each option and evaluation of options from the many to the few as we continue to move forward in the process. And the goal is to submit all the work to date in April to the MSBA. Uh, with that and the idea of engagement and communication and, and allowing people to access uh, the developments in this project. Next slide, if you would, um, Jason. One of, the, one of the things that comes to mind is meetings. And ever since the pandemic, our shift as a society to the possibility of remote meetings we often have this conversation in my office and with our team uh, around what meeting format might be best to secure wider participation from the community, remote or in person. In the spirit of trying to be respectful of our community desire, we're curious about your perspectives on this question. And if you can take a moment uh, to add your feedback, we'd appreciate it.
It looks like we still have 60 folks that are logged on, so over half that are responding. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you for that feedback. All right, um, we are uh, gonna move to try and do our best in the next just couple of minutes to respond to some of the questions that have come in. Um, I should have pointed out that we also have an email address on the project website for additional questions that come forth. We'll do our best to compile these and generate a written response for those that um, may not be here tonight and, and certainly have similar questions in their mind. I'll do my best to try and navigate the questions as I see that they've come uh, forward and uh, welcome the panelists here tonight to help out. Uh, does the planning process scope include a comprehensive life cycle budgeting approach addressing both long-term operating costs and renewal needs to prevent the over time to uh, ensure sustained functionality? I'll take that one. So definitely we will be looking at the life cycle cost analysis as part of the process. Um, we, as part of an MSBA project, we are required to reach LEED Silver certification. And part of that process is also including the life cycle cost analysis. So we will be uh, reviewing this as uh, a sustainable building and its impacts um, and its efficiency, its thermal envelope. Um, but we will also be looking at the long-term cost and comparing it to the different options that we select, you know, whether we look at three different mechanical systems, for example, we'll be evaluating the cost of that um, upfront cost versus um, the long-term cost of those systems. So that'll be definitely part of the process that we um, review. Uh, question, Jason, I think definitely for your, yourself, what is the meaning of public and private space in the design diagrams? Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Brand. Um, when we refer to public spaces, we're referring to those spaces that may want to be accessed by the public um, after school hours on the weekends without providing access to, in this case, what we're calling private areas, which would include general classrooms, offices, uh, those kinds of features. That separation also serves a safety and security function by what we call compartmentalizing the building. So public spaces are those uh, accessible or use, potentially useful to the public after hours and private spaces are largely uh, classrooms and offices. Thanks, Jason. Um, you mentioned uh, in some of the diagram, Article 97. Could you, for those not familiar with that, um, give some... Sure. Uh, Article... 97, um, it has to do with the conservation of natural resources. So um, you cannot repurpose land that is designated as Article 97 without a two thirds vote of the Massachusetts legislature. So it is um, a factor that we definitely have to consider because it can impact the schedule. Um, and it would also have to go through a whole process of reviewing, um, for example, if we're gonna repurpose land elsewhere as part of um, like a land swap, you know, all of that would have to be factored in. So it is definitely something that we would um, have to factor in and consider as part of the process. For future questions around environmental impact, um, some of the designs may warrant, or some of the sites may warrant um, the reduction of trees. Uh, is the environmental impact in these designs considered during the design process? Sure. Um, anytime we, you know, place a building on the site, we're looking for uh, the ability to uh, reduce impact to natural features on the site. And often we really try hard to utilize those features as learning experiences um, as part of our design. Um, right now, it's very hard to see in these diagrams what we're doing uh, because these are test fits. Uh, we take a square footage, we're creating um, a building configuration based on the goals that have been developed through the educational um, visioning process and design, uh, placing them on the site, but also factoring in um, circulation, separation of vehicles with the buses, um, you know, the, the amount of parking that is associated with a, a pre-K five, for example, you know, it's approximately 170 spaces that we have to consider. So all of those right now, we're test fitting them onto the site. Um, these are not 
uh, set in stone by any means. They are constantly going to be evolved and massaged to make it work for, um, you know, this project and the goals of the project. And, you know, as right now, like I said, as a test fit, we're using these um, to go from the many to the few. And then in the next phase, we will be developing those few options into further in, in further detail. And then um, from there, we'll have a much better idea of how each of those sites will impact the sites around it um, and the environmental impacts around it. So um, right now it's just a test fit. So, you know, it, you're not able to really see how these will interact other than, uh, for example, the town hall site where there is a large wooded area, for example, um, you know, we don't necessarily have to impact that far end of the site, it's just a matter of how many fields you would want. Wildwood, on the other hand, is a much smaller site. So to fit a pre-K-5 building on that site would really encompass the entire site when you consider parking and circulation as well as the building itself. So this just gives you an idea of the size of the building, the, the parking and circulation, and then um, the impact of, uh, you know, a wooded area or not to make it work. Uh, maybe a question for you, Julian. It's somewhat related to that, but um, someone was interested in knowing when the geography of the three um, of the sites is set. Is it in the shortlist stage, or is there time um, after the shortlist to refine or alter the geography of the sites? Um, uh, and I, I if if the, if the question is yeah. about the location of certain site features or the shape of the building. Right. Um, <clears throat> we often describe it in our office as dealing with marshmallows right now. Everything is still uh, highly malleable. So we have a sense of where on sites buildings could go, but there's still a lot of time to massage shape or where an addition could go. An example of that that we could give is some of the feedback we've already received about one of the addition renovation scenarios at the North Intermediate site was could we change the location of some of those academic fingers to introduce a longer um, parent queue distance? And the answer to that is yes, right? There's, there's still plenty of design opportunity in the process. We're not locked into any particular shape or form. As Ronnie has said, we're just doing test fits right now. We want the sort of essence of some of these concepts to continue, but there's still lots of room for uh, altering or massaging uh, the design all the way up until we get um, through the schematic design phase. Jason, can you explain how we orient the building so that people understand for daylighting? Sure. Um, there's a rule of thumb that the best daylighting um, orients uh, comes from classrooms that are oriented with windows facing north and south. Windows that face north, there's no uh, need for controlling the daylight because it's the most diffuse, it's the most um, welcoming daylight. Um, windows that face south, even though there's a potential for glare, south facing windows are the easiest uh, daylight to control either with um, sun shades or the building or some other shading device. So we orient buildings or we try to orient buildings with particularly classroom windows facing either north and south. And so for example, on the North Intermediate site, when you saw the two fingers poking out there to the west, we've tried to orient them as north-south as we can. Part of the reason we looked at the north end of the Woburn Street site was for exactly the same reason, so that we could orient um, those classrooms with the proper solar orientation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, question around the standard, um, how does the standard gym size of a pre-K to three option compared to the West and the Shawshank gymnasiums, which most most in the community seem to perhaps find insufficient for community use? I'm not, I'm not sure we have a, a good answer to that. Uh, we don't have that data at our, at our uh, fingertips at the moment but we can uh, make a record of that particular question and issue an answer to that. What we can say is that the MSBA guideline for a standard elementary school gym is 6,000 square feet. That's large enough to have high school court lines in it, but with no spectator seating. It only has the sort of the safety runoff area and nothing else. The gymnasium that's proposed in the pre-K-5 concepts at the moment is a 12,000 square foot gymnasium which is also large enough to have high school court lines running in both directions, both the long direction and the short direction. 
And if you were to have a basketball game, um, often those have bleachers that can uh, telescope away from the wall and not overlap the main court line. So that's the primary differences between the two models that are being explored, but we'll certainly do a little bit of research and get those data points for those other two existing gymnasiums to help people understand how big these really are. Thanks, Jason. There's a couple of, uh, there's a theme in a couple of questions around um, uh, the buildings and, and the fact that uh, there's an awful lot of um, asphalt pavement around for parking and for access for uh, cars and buses um, and some concerns with diversions, you know, where in many of the designs, it's inevitable that those have to be crossed. Um, is there are there options that um, that exist with the sites that we have in which something like that might be possible? I'm paraphrasing, trying to piece these together, but that's the, the general gist of the question. Public questions. Yeah, I think the gist of the question is: Is there opportunities to consider other design strategies for how site circulation works? in each one of the concepts. And then again, the short answer to that is yes, there's still time to um, do additional iterations of each one of these concepts. And I think what the design team and the school building committee are interested in are exactly what's being described in the question. We wanna separate parent vehicles, bus vehicles, pedestrians, create the safest conditions we can, You know, for example, limit the number of crosswalks over vehicular circulation routes if we can. And obviously sites are constrained geometrically. We may not be able to achieve the ideal conditions that folks might be looking for, but there's certainly opportunity to explore more and different design solutions to those particular um, requests and features. Can I jump in on that for a second? Sure, go ahead. I know that a lot of the um, design options that were shown today show the bus going around the perimeter of the building. And I think that that was one of uh, a few of the questions were surrounding that. Typically what we do in those instances is we put a safety gate once the drop off for the buses are completed. So that when students are going out for recess, that cars can't go through that um, perimeter of the building and it's only ac accessed uh, at pickup and drop off. Uh, and I think um, one of the, one of, I think we've covered in general most of the questions or many of the questions. One uh, question though, is there, has there been consideration around uh, walkers um, and bike riders uh, and their um, and their intersection, so to speak, with any of these designs? And um, I, I'll leave that to Jason or Ron if you want to respond to that. Yeah, we, we will want to know more about how particularly students are arriving to the site um, if they're not arriving by car. And just as I mentioned in my last response, we would endeavor to design site, uh, sidewalks and crosswalks to limit the crossover points um, of people arriving to the site uh, in those two ways, and then provide places for them to put bi you know, bicycles um, on the site once, once they've arrived you know, near the front door. So yes, there is there's more work to do related to that. And we have given that some consideration even in these early concepts, but there's certainly still more investigation to do there and, uh, and more design work to do there. And if I could add something, I was gonna say the, um, once we get into the schematic design phase, which is when we have one option that is the preferred option, we'll actually conduct a traffic study and that will, will indicate you know, if how the traffic patterns are moving, um, you know, where what direction are the buses coming from, where are all the cars coming from, how they're entering the site, whether or not we should add a traffic stop, for example. Um, and as Jason mentioned, you know, where the crosswalk should be for kids to enter and access the site or bikers. So that detailed study, which is the traffic study, will happen in schematic design once we um, have a preferred option. Great, right. Ronnie. Um, I think with that, we will uh, wrap up uh, this uh, second uh, community forum for the Wildwood School Building Project. Um, I want to take this opportunity and thank uh, Ronnie, Julie, and Jason for you being here as part of the panel today and all of your work in, in uh, helping make this uh, happen. A uh, great team to work with, and our community is very fortunate to, uh, to be alongside you for this journey. Thank you to the many in the community who joined this evening. We will work hard to try and get this recording 
and all of the instructions for members who are of the community who are not here tonight to be able to log on and to share their feedback similar to how those in attendance tonight did. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get this out within 24 hours to the community, and I welcome you and encourage you to share it with friends and neighbors and relatives. Uh, we really are interested in your feedback. Um, again, stay connected through this process. Uh, we have a website uh, in which you can submit uh, further questions, and we'll do our very best to compile the questions uh, and answers as we move forward. Uh, so with that, unless there's anything further, um, thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, we will uh, be in touch soon for our next community forum. And remember, while the school building committee meetings are uh, certainly open and accessible to anyone who wishes to join. Thanks, everybody. Good night.